Researchers in the field of forensic psychology have been toying with a new idea recently, that humans don't always make good decisions. Where's the proof, you might ask? Well, green ash trees are a good example. Ashes, especially green ash, they're a nice tree for yards, field edges, boulevards, etc. They grow fast, they get pretty big, give good shade, uh, they have good roots that don't tend to sucker or compete with crops too much, they can live a few hundred years. And they're very tolerant of urban conditions, pollution, salt particularly. A bit generic looking perhaps, but maybe that's just me. Until recently, these were one of the most popular trees to plant in both cities and out in the field shelter belts and windrows. That is, since the uh, Dutch elm disease wiped out most of the elms. But it turns out a lot of places didn't learn that lesson with the elms, and that planting vast cityscapes of a single type of tree can be pretty risky. And green ash got planted in droves throughout Canada and the states, in some cities having upwards of 40% of the trees in a city being green ash. The Stanley Soil Management Association here reported that in the roughly 600 miles of field shelter belts they've planted here south central Manitoba, about 80% of them either were green ash alone or contained green ash mixed in with other trees. That number has gone down over time, but it's still quite a high number overall. But as you might have noticed the last few years, in a lot of North American cities, many of them are either dying or being marked for removal with the words emerald ash borer flying around a lot. So what's happening exactly with that? Well, the symptoms connected with emerald ash borer can be confused with a few other ash diseases, with limbs dying and yellowing out of season, especially in areas where the trees are stressed. But the big problem now is caused by an insect. A nice looking jewel beetle with metallic green elytra, the emerald ash borer. They come from North and East Asia, and they aren't really a problem for the trees over there, but due to a variety of factors, they come over here and just decimate whole populations of particularly green, black, and white ash. Currently threatening to wipe out about 8 billion more ash trees over here. So how does this insect do it? Well, they can smell the trees from quite a distance off, the chemicals in the leaves and the bark, and bonus if the tree is either weakened or maybe young with very thin bark. Once they find one, they lay a few dozen eggs in the grooves and cracks in the bark, sometimes up to a few hundred. Within two weeks, the eggs darken and then hatch, and the larvae chew through the bark into the tissues that carry water and nutrients throughout the trunk, the inner phloem and outer xylem. And that's where they set up shop for the next year or two, eating out long, winding galleries of tunnels. As you might imagine, this is pretty damaging to the tree, and with these tunnels, water and sap can't flow freely throughout the tree's trunk, and it basically starves and dries out. Sometimes the tree manages to put out a bunch of emergency seeds before it dies, but oftentimes, and this is one thing that makes it worse than Dutch elm disease for elms, is that it can kill the trees before they're even mature enough to produce seeds. Once these larvae reach their mature length of about 3 centimeters, they fold up, pupate, and reach maturity. They'll emerge as an adult in the spring, leaving a telltale D-shaped hole in the bark. And if that tree has become firewood while well, some are still inside, they'll emerge from there and fly around to search for other nearby trees. This is why you see so many warnings against moving firewood. If even one log has ash borers, it can spread and cause thousands or even millions more trees to die. And once one tree is infected, if nothing's done about it, typically all the ash trees in an area will die within about 10 years. Many areas have regulations against moving ash wood without some sort of e permit of either uh, inspection or treatment of the wood, such as chipping or heating, something that would destroy the insects. Now, these insects did come over from Asia, where they also have ash trees, but the ash trees there aren't as affected. And why is that? Well, first it's worth pointing out that while they do do well in areas with urban pollution, they are still usually stressed and a little bit weakened by the soil compaction, by the heat, and by the low genetic diversity. I mean, if all these city ashes had just been wild harvested and replanted in the city, they would still be at risk, but less so because that diversity does help them out. As it is, these ashes are bred for very specific characteristics, looks, shape, lack of seeds, etc., which, sure, that's great and all, but that leaves you with vast numbers of what are usually either clones or very closely related trees, all with more or less equal susceptibility to all the same diseases and attacks. 
And in Asha's case, it's common that for even huge chunks of a city, all the trees might come this, from the same four or so parent plants. As another reason for this difference, how Asian and American ashes are affected, and there's some of the classic reasons like predators that are found over there but not here, but in this case the chemistry of the trees also plays a big role. Borer larvae can only successfully survive in a tree if they can break down certain otherwise toxic chemicals, and in Ash's case tannins are one of the main groups of chemicals like that. As it turns out, Asian ashes tend to be much higher in tannins than their American counterparts, with the notable exception of blue ash, which, probably not coincidentally, is also one of the American ashes least affected by the emerald ash borer. And of course, tannins aren't the only defense they have against these insects, but it seems that North American ashes just aren't as able to recognize the ash borer attacking either and respond appropriately. Interestingly though, there are these lingering ashes, which are these American ashes that seem pretty much unaffected while all the ashes around them are getting wiped out. And this is why it's good to maintain genetic diversity, because even when most of the trees are getting wiped out, you can still have these outliers that stick around and help the species survive. Some scientists are investigating these to try maybe breeding them to, to make uh, emerald ash borer resistant ashes more publicly available here. Well, let's hope this doesn't just turn into another monoculture, but it is a promising lead. But one of the unfortunate things about this situation is it isn't just people's lawns and field shelter belts that are being affected. In a lot of the forests they grow in, ashes are a keystone species, providing food for a lot of different animals, especially with their seeds. One of the most concerning relationships right now is with frogs. It turns out many North American frogs rely on having ashes around, particularly in the tadpole stage, because these leaves fallen down into a puddle and starting to break down, it turns out those make excellent food for tadpoles, especially native ashes, because unlike Asian ashes, maples, and some of the other trees they're replacing these with, the green, white, and black ashes are all pretty low in tannins. Put a high tannin tree in there, and the tadpoles, they don't tend to survive as well, and the adults that do survive tend to be smaller. So in an unfortunate turn of events, this aspect that's critical for their survival against emerald ash borer, having more tannins, is exactly opposite to what makes them so good for some of the species they're supporting here. And it remains to be seen whether these lingering ash populations are also good for the tadpoles or similarly unhelpful to their foreign counterparts. One good thing at least is that there seems to be a northern limit for these emerald ash borers because of the cold. And the 2018 to 19, the record cold there, killed off well over half of the emerald ash borer that were kind of in the northeastern states in Canada. That, that, that could have brought me comfort when I was walking to school in minus 45 degree wind chills. So what's to be done? Well, increased diversity, that is a good preventative. One way that's being addressed in city planning is through the 5-10-20 rule. It's kind of a rule of thumb to have only 5% of the trees in a given area be the same species, 10% be of the same genus, and 20% be of the same family. Field shelter belts too. The Stanley Soil Management Association has been promoting planting shelter belts with more species diversity as well. Monitoring is kind of the next step, and for that you'll sometimes see these purple or green devices on the trees. They're traps, rigged with male pheromones, though they only catch enough for monitoring purposes, not really for reducing the population. Sometimes for monitoring, a certain parasitoid wasp is also observed. It hunts all kinds of jewel beetles, including ash borers, and brings them to its burrows to feed its larvae. So biologists can kind of watch what sorts of beetles these guys are carrying around and sometimes that tells them whether there's emerald ash borer in the area. So monitoring and prevention, those are the first steps, and all the further control efforts are generally aimed at slowing their spread and reproduction, reducing their numbers, preventing them from reaching maturity, and, as has unfortunately become necessary, thinning out ash populations to prevent them from spreading. There are some insecticides used, ones that get inside the tree and prevent further infestation, but of course this isn't really feasible nor probably safe to do large scale outside of urban areas. Four species of biocontrol insects have been released in the last decade, uh, predators from the ash borer's home range in an attempt to control them here. 
So far the results have been promising, though it remains to be seen if this is sustainable long term and if they'll survive into the northern parts of the Emerald Ash Borer's invasive range. But scientists are currently looking at other ways to control them as well, like using certain pathogenic fungi to attack the insects. The most common option, however, and often the simplest in urban environments, is simply to thin out the ash trees and replace them with other less vulnerable and less common species of tree. And I mean, that has a pretty big upside too. A lot of animals do rely on ashes, but a lot of animals do also rely on other trees for food and shelter, ones that often get left out from the sorts of things that humans like to plant. But anyways, this is a tree that you probably shouldn't be planting more of right now in your windrows or your shelter belts or wherever. But fortunately, functionally, there are a lot of good alternatives. If you have some suggestions, I'd be glad to hear them in the comments. But in next week's video, we will be looking at a few alternatives that have good edible value for humans as well. So stay tuned for that. But anyways, that's all I have for this week. As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or disparaging remarks or good ash alternatives, uh, let me know in the comments. And liking and subscribing always really helps me out. This video was brought to you by the Stanley Soil Management Association. The SSMA is a non-for-profit organization that offers various ecological goods and services throughout the Pembina Valley Watershed District and beyond. In addition to providing tree sales to landowners, they've planted well over 600 miles of shelter belts since 1987, or somewhere over 700,000 trees. So for more interesting and tasty plants from the forests and prairies of Manitoba, join me next time on Ambling with Sam.